Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Big Ideas on the Go. Um, I'm excited to have with us um, the president of Future Privacy Forum, uh, Jules Polonetsky. I hope I got that uh, correct. Uh, Jules, welcome to the show. Delighted to be with you, Dimitri. So Jules and I have known each other for a little bit of time since um, Jules is one of the major advocates um, uh, in Washington on privacy rights and, and privacy uh, evolution. So maybe Jules, for the audience, you could talk a little bit about um, what you've been doing in terms of privacy advocacy as part of the Future Privacy Forum over the last 12 years. Super. Well, you know, when I started FPF, 12 years ago, my thought was there wasn't a really good place in the center of the privacy debate. The trade groups did their thing, supporting industry interests, and advocates in civil society spent their time critiquing and worrying about the surveillance economy and, uh, you know, often had very good points, but were more likely to be litigating and critiquing than maybe convening everybody and saying, how do we get the good we want, right? How do we support advertising in a responsible way? How do we have the data available for research? How do we support, you know, mobility and all the utility um, and actually take seriously that there are challenges here, that people can be heard, that there are serious regulatory issues. Um, and so that's what we do. We've got almost 200 companies involved, typically the senior privacy teams, the chief privacy officers, the DPOs, the senior executives who are trying to figure out how do I do business globally? How do I deal with cookies and how do I deal with AI? And you know, what are the tools I need to scale this? Where, how do I find my data in the first place? Um, and, and where are the tools tailored for me? But we also bring the advocates and the academics and frankly, the regulators. We say to them, how do we help you? The smarter you are, the more you understand the details of the nuts and bolts, the more effective a regulator you are going to be. So that's our daily bread and butter. And we do this in the, the US, Europe, uh, Israel, and we are in the midst of opening our Asia Pacific regional office and really excited about that. Ah, congratulations. That's amazing. So look, you've come a long way in 12 years. So maybe you could give us kind of an arc uh, of your career in privacy. And, 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 you know, I think maybe equally important, just an understanding of how you've seen privacy evolve, right? So you mentioned a few topics that are, um, um, that are being discussed right now, but maybe you could kind of take us over the last 20 years since the dawn of the internet. <laughs> I did start at the dawn of the internet. Uh, you know, I was a, a, a public official the first third of my career. I was an elected state legislator in New York. I was the consumer affairs commissioner for the city of New York, uh, a congressional staffer for then Congressman Chuck Schumer uh, and other assorted uh, gigs. And one day I heard about some company getting into trouble. They were called Double Click. I didn't know what that was. There was some sign in New York that said, welcome to Silicon Alley, Double Click. Um, and um, something to do with cookies and tracking. And I came in suddenly, since I had a public reputation as a consumer regulator, to be their first chief privacy officer. And the debate at this time, and there'd been privacy debates earlier when the social security number was created, uh, you know, when the Privacy Act was passed in the US to set rules for, for government data, um, uh, you know, when people started appreciating the impact of the Hollerith and the computing machines in, in, in uh, Nazi era and in uh, surveillance societies in Europe. But the first time where perhaps some of these issues, uh, you know, moved from public affairs and, and, you know, insiders and geeks to the front pages of business sections, perhaps, was when that double click merger with Abacus and the awareness that cookies could be used to track you and they might even identify you, you might actually be revealing the sensitive things you did online. So coming in in those days, um, the, the challenge for all of us and the early chief privacy officers of the world was, what should the rules be? Because the US did not have a broad privacy uh, uh, structure as we don't today. Um, we had sector specific rules, obviously for, uh, for, for banking, for finance, for health, uh, for kids, uh, but we didn't have a general set of rules. And so many of these companies who thought they were just doing good things, hey, uh, ads to help keep websites free, were shocked. Uh, they were being celebrated as startup you know, billionaires uh, and, and uh, democratizers of access you know, to content and freedom. And all of a sudden they were being um, prosecuted by attorneys general, by federal trade commission, by regulators. So the early days was how do we self-regulate? And everyone believed in self-regulation at that point, even some of the critics. Today, obviously that's, that's not so uh, clear that uh, anybody believes in that. Um, but in those days, uh, the challenge was what should the rules be um, how do we respect what people want? How do we even explain to them uh, what's going on? 
And it was marketing and marketing and marketing. And then came 9-11. Um, and the ad market collapsed and all these sexy companies went bankrupt and nobody was all that interested in who did what with cookies. Instead, we wanted to know why didn't we have the data to link together if some possible terrorist was getting a license to fly a plane and if we knew they came in, why didn't our authorities have this data linked together uh, where and what is wrong with our databases? And we spent a period of time uh, changing our laws and building out surveillance structure. And very soon, as 9-11 obviously still, you know, potent in our lives, but as it wasn't, you know, what happened the day before, uh, we started looking and saying, wait a second, did we just go too far, right? The Snowden revelations, did we build? And so the marketing questions were not front of mind. Um, the government surveillance questions were front of mind. And now here we are today, and we're worried, I think, about both. The marketing uh, you know, years are back. Data uses are happening that we were only dreaming of back in those double-click days. Um, we claimed we knew who you were online. We really didn't. We had some messy cookie information. But now, indeed, right, information about you can be immediately pinned and penned and targeted. And um, it's become a challenge for, for folks in the business world to keep up with not only the intense regulatory uh, developments, which are generally a positive uh, thing when they work out uh, in carefully considered ways, um, but the, the media concerns, the ethics concerns, the consumer concerns. Uh, so one of the things we've turned to in recent years is how do we support the people making tools, the big IDs of the world, the others, um, who can help- What others? What others, Jules? What they're others? All, they're all, there may be a few others here and there, um, uh, uh, hey, the other big issue is competition, and I don't think we yet have competition dominance issues in the market, but the big trend, I think, for privacy folks, um, certainly at the bigger companies, um, is going to be, uh, are you really thinking carefully about competition um, and portability and sharing your data when you are obligated to do so? I think that's going to be a really, um, you know, obviously industry does business and people share data but we're coming up to a world where mandating access, right? Not just to consumers, but maybe to other companies uh, is gonna be part of privacy uh, obligations. So that's what we're looking forward to. Yeah, I know, like you, you touched on a few kind of interesting points and clearly I think there, you know, the, the whole kind of idea of tools and technology is relatively new. I think privacy from kind of the, uh, the beginning of the internet was much more geared around policy and, and programs uh, that you would pull, put in place. And, and now there's this kind of shift of product um, in Israel, in the U.S., in Europe. Uh, in fact, I had an interesting call with a new uh, new company just prior to uh, you and I speaking. So you guys actually just kind of um, uh, dipped your toe into this arena around helping organizations understand kind of the emerging technology space. So maybe you could talk a little bit about your tech vendor report, why you did it, what you found, and how do you think that's going to be changing over the next couple of years? Well, look, I got to tell you, you've proved me wrong. So um, let me just tell you, when I first met you, and I think it was at a conference in, in Europe, and I saw, well, I saw a big ID booth, and, and you were there, and I said, there's no way, this is nuanced stuff. Like, you need lawyers sitting on every one of these issues, um, putting these things into tools that scale. It, it's not doable. There's so much nuance. Every issue I'll debate and discuss exactly what does it actually legally mean, um, and frankly, I said the, the same thing to, uh, you know, a couple of the other leaders in the sector when they started, I said, you can't scale these things. It's too, uh, too legal and too complex. Um, and here we are a number of years later. And um, the reality is most folks at organizations cannot function um, because at the end of the day, once they do their work, they need the tools. Um, and if you're a small and medium enterprise, frankly, the tool may be the only thing you have because there is no lawyer at your hand. And yeah. if you are a lawyer at a major organization and you've you know, been doing privacy impact assessments and you've been trying to map your data and you've been trying to use uh, de-identification tools, you need systems to scale these things. And it's been remarkable to see the industry grow. But also, I think what we found in this report, and frankly, we did this report for two reasons. One is our daily stakeholders, our generally the chief privacy officers of, you know, 200 plus companies. And they complained to us that it's hard to figure out what they're buying. Why do they need to do all this due diligence? Um, there are all these tools in the market, but there, there's a pain point in that they may not, uh, they've got to do a lot of work to understand who's selling what. If I need data mapping, 
what exactly are the functions that are part of that and who actually has it and how does it work so I can compare you know, apples to apples. So we, we said, you know what, let's actually try to talk to not only the leading CPOs, but the leading companies that are providing these services and understand this market a bit better. And they're, you know, they're Gartner reports and Forrester reports, but they're generally sort of focused on uh, who's growing fastest and what are the business sectors and, you know, investors. And we said, can we work with the industry to see how it sees itself and where it sees opportunities to deal with some challenges? So what did we learn, right? We learned some things that are maybe obvious, right? During COVID, obviously there was this digital acceleration. So no surprise, companies spent money um, significantly, even if they were cutting in other areas because of COVID issues on adopting marketplace privacy technologies. Um, we saw that the intense rollout of regulation, the state level, the increasing details around regulation around the world was a big driver. Even if you've got a big department handling legal, legal and privacy, you need advice and support in order to manage this stuff globally. Um, subject access rights are, are now not, oh, look at that, that law has that, I better build it. No, this is now part of core uh, need uh, if you're going to build a product uh, globally. Um, but what we did also see was that this, this lack of common terminology, this lack of common taxonomy, um, people saying they do de-identification, people saying they do data mapping, people saying they've got this tool or that tool, um, uh, was a bit of a challenge and an area where the industry could do some work to have some common framing uh, for what they do. And the last point I'll make is um, we saw these tools evolving from sort of one-off things. I need something to handle a cookie matter. I need uh, a tool just to do uh, data mapping. We saw these companies starting to become platforms, um, platforms for risk management broadly. Um, and either we saw that because of consolidation um, or we saw that uh, with alliances between products that work together. Um, and we saw the buyers increasingly saying, you know, it's the same data and it's the same kind of uh, integration. Um, I want these things to work together. Um, and I increasingly want one tool that will, um, as I have time or energy to think about other adjacent data protection compliance issues, I can add it or I can um, flip it on. And then the last, last point I'll make is that, and this is probably still just the beginning, um, the ESG mantra, which is such a significant thing at the very corporate level and at the major you know, investor and investment manager level, um, obviously we're seeing the, the Black Rocks and these folks saying, we actually are gonna invest and we are asking questions based on ESG. And that has typically obviously meant climate and human rights. And we're seeing privacy and data protection just starting to become a component of that ESG report. And I think people can be skeptical, you know, do businesses really mean it when they talk about ethics and this and that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, having been on the other side of a lot of these questions, when an investor or a board level um, executive says simply, how are you doing in that area? As they've been doing, obviously, in cybersecurity and other areas, it sets off lots of, you know, uh, trickle down throughout the company and investment and, oh, the board actually asked about this. Or an investor who owns 20% of our shares because they invest, you know, billions of dollars has said they're going to have a scorecard. And that gives, I think, the teams that we all deal with some of the energy they need to get the work they want done. Yeah, look, I think in kind of touching on some of that, I think, you know, one of the other things that we've seen just in the last maybe year or so, and you talked about kind of this um, interface around data protection and how this becomes kind of a board level um, decision is this kind of injection where privacy is now becoming a concern for security, right? Because security cares about personal data, restricted data, sensitive data, uh, regulated data, uh, which includes now personal data. And increasingly data governance. I think historically data governance was almost kind of absent of any information of, well, is this a special type of data? And increasingly you're, you're seeing this kind of evolution, even with ourselves and OneTrust, where we're entering the data governance arena um, with a unique vantage point where we're not only aware of all your data, we're, we're also aware of some of this other metadata, operational metadata around, around privacy and around 
uh, personal data and around uh, restricted data. So I am curious about what you're seeing in the market, where, what you expect over the coming years, where privacy with it was this kind of priesthood amongst lawyers um, that dealt with kind of regulations and interpreting them. And now you're seeing other people get in the mix, the, the security and risk organization, uh, the data organization. So what happens? Is everyone going to care about privacy or is it just are the other folks just going to have to have kind of some visibility, but no, no real kind of uh, power? Yeah, you know, this was a, a point that one of the senior chief privacy officers raised one saying, hey, it's great that my CTO and um, CISO and so forth are spending the budget, not mine. I don't have it. Um, and they've got, you know, teams and people and resources. But wait a second. Um, where am I going to be in a couple of years if the trends of the people who actually, you know, spend and build and do security and do data governance are the ones who take ownership of it? Am I simply going to be, you know, giving a little bit of legal input? Or am I the owner of this process? Or am I in some partnership in some really deep way? Um, I don't have the program management team. I have lawyers, perhaps. Um, I don't have the deep technical chops. I simply say, the law says de-identification means it shall not be reasonably this and that, right? And then some data scientists and governance people are saying, okay, uh, A, you haven't given me enough detail there, but uh, we'll take it from here. So I think that the challenge is that we don't yet really have the sort of unified senior ownership of this. Who does it really belong to um, at organizations? And, and right now it ends up being a mix and, and, and the people writing the checks who at the end of the day are often you know, the key folks um, are not necessarily the people who are telling you exactly what the requirements are, um, but yet it's their service, but yet it's also serving, you know, security and confidentiality. So I think that was one of the big challenges that we saw. It's becoming this um, key platform that the organization needs um, to support the business goals. You know, one key point of the report is if you look at these things as um, simply supporting these different functions or this different compliance, you're really missing uh, the, the goal that at the most senior levels, you know, companies think about business outcomes and the business outcome is, is the data available uh, without, you know, risk, without problems um, for the utility that the company needs. And when you start becoming the core, you know, organization that says, hey, if data is our key asset as just about every company, you know, thinks about it, um, and this is the set of tools and systems that ensure that I can collect it and use it and have it and govern it and so forth. Um, that's you, you're now the central, you know, backbone. Um, and I don't think we've yet seen the the integration of those teams. Uh, we we just uh, helped run the Pepper Conference, they, which has become one of the leading privacy engineering conferences, and um, it has assembled a lot of the leading privacy engineers at um, many leading businesses. And you know, uh, uh, panel after panel, you saw sort of the frustration between these folks who often maybe own you know the tool or own the uh, business process, saying the lawyers can't give us what we need. We need standards. We need protocols. Instead, you're giving us you know legal words that that haven't been well mapped to the tools. So a lot of work ahead for this sector. But you know, again, one of the reasons why we helped organize this Privacy Tech Alliance is that who should best be doing some of that bridging, right? Uh, you guys in so many ways deal with this group of stakeholders because you're doing integration, because you're building the tool, you're building it to the legal requirements, right? You, you're sort of forced to be the integrator between those different departments. And we think that there's a broad leadership role that the sector can play in solving these problems for everybody in a way that will support, you know, not only the businesses, uh, but um, what regulators and policy people want as well. Yeah, no, fair enough. So, you know, one of the other kind of things that are changing, and it's obviously we started off with kind of one, one omnibus regulation in Europe with GDPR, and now you're seeing, um, you know, after that we had CCPA, and I think this year so far we've seen Virginia, and it looks like Colorado is going to introduce some bills. I think there's been some rumors or at least some thought that maybe Florida will introduce something. Uh, you know, Washington perennially kind of looks like they're going to introduce something maybe next year. Um, 
What's the state of, of play right now in terms of regulations, both in the U.S. and internationally? What happens the remainder of this year, 2021? What happens over the coming uh, two, three years? So big picture, data is in the process of moving from being mostly unregulated, other than you know high-level GDPRs and so forth, to a very specific micro-regulated. And when I say even GDPR generally, is that uh, we now are going to have an AI regulation on top of GDPR, right? And we're going to have a regulations for data spaces, right? We're getting, I'll call it GDPR level two by the regulators going back and saying, well, wait a second, big platforms need additional requirements. Uh, if it's AI, we need additional requirements. If it's um, health and data sharing, uh, right? So the DSA, the DGA. So even in the areas where there has been a regulatory structure like Europe, we're getting round two. You know, people who are in the financial uh, world, obviously, or health world have long been aware that, you know, detailed heavy or regulation is part of life. And in the rest of the world, um, we've uh, lived in a world where it was, well, follow the consumer protection laws. Uh, oh, or there's a novelty, here comes California. So we're in the midst of a pace where every state is going to regulate. I was a state regulator. Once you see other states passing bills, you're like, well, why don't we have a privacy bill? Oh, let me just take the California one and you know fix it up and hear some hearings. So. Uh, Colorado, the governor is anticipated to sign their bill any moment. Obviously, we have Virginia. Connecticut may move. They just put their bill, which wasn't doing well, into a budget bill. So um, we'll have two, three, four years of state by state. And then the question is, will Washington step in to preempt? Um, this year, probably not. The priority for the Biden administration is helping solve the fact that, well, it just might be illegal at this moment to transfer data from Europe to the US because of the Schrems decision. We, we just got new standard contractual clauses from the um, uh, European Commission. It comes with a lot of complicated compliance work, um, not only mapping where all your data is, obviously, and uh, when and where you're moving it internationally, but assessments of every international jurisdiction as to whether it meets a surveillance standard, whether you get you know, a, a detailed you know, privacy assessment uh, just tailored to uh, the international piece of data flows. So for better or worse, um, regulation is coming. It's coming fast. It's not going to be consistent. That's apologies for that. Um, uh, we will eventually see, you know, uh, a federal bill. The U.S. is one of the only democracies in the world. China is in the midst of putting in regulation before the U.S. around consumer data protection. Um, so we will, but uh, we'll be slower. Um, uh, uh, people who follow the debate closely know that probably the biggest thing holding up the bills that are that are that have been introduced at the federal level is the debate around enforcement. Um, will you have private rights of action that can lead to class action liability, um, and will you preempt all the state laws, or will it be on top of the state laws, or only preempt some of the state laws? What people aren't paying enough attention to is that the political debate of these sort of preemptions and. That's money and liability and enforcement. Um, nobody has ever been elected or not elected based on how they voted on a very specific privacy bill. The big issue that these bills now are going to cover is civil rights. These bills now cover data-driven discrimination and AI. And the civil rights community, which is an incredibly important political force and moral force and social force, right? We get that, right? We've had years of, um, uh, hey, ha are we doing enough about racism in this country? Uh, as we record this podcast, it's Juneteenth, right? We're finally recognizing a federal holiday in the U.S. Um, and so uh, the social concern and did you vote and what did you do about civil rights? And this is going to be the priority for the Biden administration since they are deeply sensitive to these issues. And so next year, um, we, I hope, will see federal privacy legislation and how it deals with data-driven discrimination will be core to it, something that hasn't been central to a lot of the state debates just yet. Okay. Well, Jules, it sounds like there's a lot happening in privacy, and clearly you're at the forefront of it. And I think maybe just to kind of summarize this podcast, it's to say, watch this space. <laughs> because uh, even though privacy has evolved uh, quite a bit since uh, the onset of the internet from the first e-commerce sites and, and um, sites with kind of diggers and, and, and rainbows, I think uh, we're seeing a real kind of um, deep change, both in terms of how people conduct privacy, who's interested in privacy, 
Um, and I think this will be kind of very informative for myself and certainly uh, I hope for our audience. So Jules, I wanna say thank you again for, for joining us. Uh, I think this was great. I appreciate you, you sparing the time for myself and the audience. Uh, so thank you and uh, look forward to talking to you more in the future. You and the Big ID team and Nimrod and Heather, you guys have not only A, built tools that we all need, but really help build this community. The, the more effective and trained and expert um, our community is, obviously the, the better we can protect the, the human rights that are at stake. So a huge thank you to your advice and support over the years and frankly, what you're doing for everybody who works in this space. Okay, well, thank you very much. Jules. Those are very kind words, unexpected and always appreciated. So thank you, <laughs> so thank you very much. So uh, for our audience, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody to subscribe to Big Ideas on the Go uh, and please leave reviews. And thank you and we'll hear from you or talk to you very soon.